All right, well, it's 11 o'clock. So hello, everyone. Welcome to our series. Uh, this is our second episode in our series, Preparing for Future Successes with Alyssa Arnold. So this series is saving money in oil and gas operations. The reason why we wanted to do with this series is there's a lot of uncontrolling factors right now. Uh, election year would already be nerve wracking for oil and gas, but now we got election year on top of COVID, oil and gas prices look like it got shot in the foot. And then we got a series of protests going on. So it's like a lot of anxiety building. So we created this webinar series to figure out things that we can control. Now, we want to interview subject matter experts to try to share the knowledge, uh, build out what we can, focus on the tips and tricks of the things that we can control. So let's get started. Now, uh, before, uh, we got a little housekeeping that we want to do. If you're new to Zoom, there is a questions box that y'all can actually be answering, uh, asking those questions along with it. Now we're gonna have a Q&A section at the end, but if there's a specific thing, um, question that you'll have during one of the presentation, put that in a box. I'm gonna be trying to get with Alyssa during it, so that way she can be trying to answer those questions as long uh, as we go along. Um, now if something goes wrong, a lot of us are working remotely. If a kid walks in, knocks down your computer, power goes out, something like that, um, don't worry about it. We're going to be posting this on our blog with a transcript. So y'all be able to get to see and uh, hear everything Alyssa is saying, and we'll be uploading it to our YouTube channel. Now, my name is Cameron Croft. I'm the chief uh, executive officer of Croft Production Systems. I got my um, bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Houston for engin mechanical engineering and project management going on to get my black belt in Six Sigma. Now the person that you actually came to this webinar to hear about is Alyssa Arnold. She got her civil engineering degree from a &M. She is a PE and she actually runs her own consulting firm, ATEX Energy Consulting. So we're gonna, she put a list together for us today that I'm actually really excited about is a series of topics and highlights, things that she really wanted to cover and that she speaks uh, with great passion to with her clients. Now, again, as we're going through these, if you see anything that you're really particular or interested in or have a certain question on, go ahead and put that in the question box so that way we can either answer it during that or we can catch it on the Q&A section at the very end. So, Alyssa? Uh, this is your introduction. So what was the purpose of this presentation? What made you want to come here today and talk? So when the price of oil really hit, you know, negative, we, uh, we saw a lot of our operators shutting in. Um, so we wanted to kind of create some items that we could be utilizing um, and our employees for, whether it's the, the lease operators or the in-office um, guys. We just, we wanted to make sure to keep everyone utilized. Um, and we knew that this was an artificial low. We know that the price of oil is going to go back up. We don't know when, but we know it will go. Uh, and so we want to be ready to start operating and, and doing our best um, to clean up our fields and, and get, get ready. Um, so that, that was kind of the purpose of all this information and all these ideas is to be able to go and apply it and um, improve your, your fields, take this time to actually make some improvements um, with the manpower that you already have on um, overhead. Well, it was kind of a hard thing to do also because I kind of put this to you and I said, Alyssa, can you tell us everything that you would want to tell a client except you had one hour to do it in? So we're, we're going to try to get that fit in. So your first talk was lease operator utilization. So what do you mean by that? Expand on that. Yeah, so, you know, the, the people who are the most underutilized right now, if you do have a shut-in field and you have employees, um, is going to be your lease operators, your pumpers, um, the guys making your everyday rounds. So we wanted to make sure um, to give them some points to focus on every day. So whether it's go, you know, check your tank grounding, um, we want to be able to use them to inspect and to review facilities on a much um, higher detail level um, than what, we, what would they do on a normal day when they have full routes to run and they have, you know, production to look over. Um, so we want to take this time to really utilize, teach them, um, take a pause, make sure everything's um, in good order uh, while, while the price of oil is low, but while they're underutilized. 
Well, that, that's the big thing is it, it's that shift mindset of going from high momentum, you know, get it, get it, get it done. And then all of a sudden, uh, pretty well capex budgets are cut, slashed in half. And then now it goes into maintenance mode and got to maintain what we have. Don't, don't go over that. So it's, it's a huge mind fo- uh, shift that we're getting from a lot of our clients of what, you know, what's the big things that we need to focus on now. So yeah, at least operator utilization, uh, I believe is kind of retooling it for the, what we're seeing. And your, your second topic was surface maintenance. Uh, I know this is a big thing for you. So kind of, yeah, expand on that. So we want to, we want to go through and check the spot for any kind of erosion. Um, this is a good time, you know, getting a, a bulldozer and, and improving your pad or doing some remediation work that you might be holding off on. Um, that's pretty cheap. The expensive part's the labor, but now that you have some lease operators that could possibly um, complete some of the labor side of it, it makes that a little bit cheaper and, and more doable. Um, and then housekeeping, just clean up all the trash um, so that if you do get a railroad commission um, inspection or EPA inspection, it just, it looks better. And, and there's no reason why, you know, right now is not going to be a good time for the guys to, to throw some extra valves they're sitting around or spool pieces are sitting, sitting around in the back of their truck, bring it to the yard and dispose of it properly or, or you know, put it in inventory. Um, cleaning up oil staining, this is huge. We don't want to have oil staining all over the site when an inspector shows up because that's just going to say that you know we've been poor operators. So um, we want to focus on that. And a lot of the, a lot of the times, this is older sites. You know, things that there hasn't been as much TLC because there's not time. Now we have time. Um, we want to make sure all of our containments are pumped down. So if there's been rainwater, whether that's you know your chemical pump containments or your large you know storage tank containments. Um, Check the external um, integrity of your piping. Look for rust. Work on repainting, which can also be done by lease operators. Not, not the most fun job, but it can be done. <laughs> um, and then weed control is, is another huge thing, especially having to do with your secondary containment. If it's an earthen berm around your tanks, is just making sure there's not weeds going through it that's de- destroying the integrity of that berm. Um, and then again, that, that reclamation of drilling pads or you know facilities that that have been out of service um taking out of service equipment out of service properly um so that they they don't leak or they don't cause um issues for you down the road well and that's what uh, you were saying earlier about oil stains so like if there is oil stains out there um uh, i mean what do you recommend for your clients is that a full-on reclamation or what i guess what is our the railroad commission's protocol for that I mean, it really depends on the extent of the oil staining of course um, you know, if it's inside the berm and it can be cleaned up, go for it. Um, if, it if it's a larger spill, there's, you know, some testing and things of that that might be required. Um, so, you know, just, it just depends on the, the, the quantity. Okay, awesome. Well, and that's what uh, I know on their second one, uh, you pretty well dive down a little bit uh, harder into this is like a facility and equipment maintenance. I know that goes along with the surface, but this is getting inside the equipment. Is that right? Yeah, and this one's huge because you should have a maintenance program, um, whether it's inspecting heat of years once a year or twice a year or every other year or whatever it may be, depending on your service. Um, this is a great time just to do it. Then you don't have to take a shutdown in the future. Again, if you've, if you've already done it in May, then obviously now is not the great time to do it because it's only been a month. But if, if you're coming up on that year and it's gonna be in the fall, just go ahead and get those maintenance items done and out of the way. It's also a good time to teach your operators about these maintenance items. Um, so they can be doing them and they can be looking for them. This is a great time for trainings or webinars um, while we're not all chasing our tails. Um, and you still might be chasing your tails. I mean, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Things are so busy, I'm sure. But it's not as busy as is the idea. Um, tank cleanouts where there might be sand or paraffin issues. This is something that we normally don't ever stop to do. But if you know a facility has a sand issue, it can prevent issues down the run, down the way. So mm-hmm. if you have you know an oil lacked or a water pump or anything like that, cleaning those tanks out to prevent failures of those um, pieces of equipment is huge. And if you are shut in making sure that you do, are doing flow line maintenance. If you, again, have the paraffin 
for H2S service, um, doing your integrity management plan, um, and really focusing on that during this time would be huge. You can, you can possibly reduce some back pressure on your wells. Um, if, if you have wells and, and flow lines, you can reduce that back pressure by cleaning that flow line out and reducing any kind of friction losses across the flow line. So when you come back online, you come back online better. Um, of course, clean your flame arresters, flares, heater traders, anything that has a flame arrestor um, that can cause back pressure, which can cause issues at the facility. Um, well, we're, we're having uh, some clients that are during the oil and gas crisis, what they're doing is um, they're kind of putting things on pause. They're actually shutting down some wells. They'll kick them back on when the oil and, pro oil and gas prices are a little bit better. So the ones that are shutting down right now, I mean, what, what's your advice on that in the facility maintenance? So it, it depends on your type of service. Um, you know, you can go as far as pickling all your vessels and your wells. Um, a lot of my clients are just washing out. Um, and it, it, if they have high paraffin, that's where we're, that's where we're, you know, spe you know, saying if you're not going to be cycling your well. So if you're going to be cycling your well every other week or so, it's probably enough movement through there, um, enough heat from your reservoir that you're not mm -hmm. going to have a huge issue. But the worst thing would be to come back to plugged up flow lines. And your flow line is going to be, because it's underground, um, and so it doesn't get the summer heat like some of your external equipment. Uh, your flow line is going to be your point of the highest chances of a paraffin blockage. Um, so I, you know, I would spend the money on, on, on pushing that liquid through, which can also help you in the long run, again, by reducing the back pressure in the future. So saving a little bit of money or spending the money now is going to save you a lot of heartache later when you're trying to come back on. Yeah, nobody Plus. likes working flow lines. <laughs> nobody <laughs> likes working over plugged off flow lines. There is no fun in that frustration. Absolutely. Well, is there anything else more you got on this? I do. So yeah. one of the big things right now is equipment is cheap. There's a lot of inventory out there. There's been, you know, some of the bigs have had huge orders that they've canceled. So they had to pay like a 15% restock fee. Mm -hmm. And so these vendors are really just trying to look to get out what they put in. Um, and so you're able to get equipment for so cheap. So if there are tanks that you have holes in the tops and you've been putting off, um, this might be a good time to look at some of those replacements or even just buying inventory for future development projects. Um, this is a really great time to look into that. Um, most vendors have inventory. You know, my group put together a huge list of like 500 products um, that's on inventory that's at highly discounted rates. I mean, some of the tanks are 50 to 60% off um, from the prices we were seeing prior to the, to the slowdown. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's huge. This is a great opportunity. And then if you have capital to spend, this is a smart way to spend it. Right. Um, and then, you know, make sure your blow down valves have plugs, um, make sure that all the pipe is supported and there's not stresses on your skids or on your vessels um, that's going to cause issues later. Maybe fix some of your pressure supports uh, or your pipe supports to, to reduce those pressures. Just little things like that. Um, and, and our idea is to give the, the pump, the, the lease operator a um, everyday, you know, item. So they're going to do the rounds anyway. So every day, go ahead and especially look for those pipe supports. Let's show them, you know, what, what you're looking for, what, what stresses um, and, and in issues you, that could be found. Um, and let's teach them that before they go out and then let them go review it all, take photos, you know, have an inspection sheet, mark it up. Um, and then you guys can kind of prioritize those types of issues. And a lot of them is not gonna be spending a, a large amount of money or even mm -hmm. any in some cases. Um, some of it's gonna be stuff you already are able to fix on, on, on within your team. Um, and then, you know, paint tanks and piping just to prevent any kind of external corrosion. Um, if you have like the, the air soil interface, make sure you're, you're taped up and that tape is still looking good uh, to prevent that corrosion since that's their highest corrosion point. Um, so yeah, I think that's, it's a lot. It's, it's a lot. lot. <laughs> sure there's more, there's definitely more. Um, but those are the main, the main items that I would suggest. So on the big one right now, especially if you got paraffin, but, um... If you're shutting down your wells, plural, keep clearing out your lines before you to do a proper shutdown for maintenance to kick it off later. 
Yeah, I mean, that, that to me is the biggest one if you're going to be shutting down indefinitely. Yeah. Um, is to make sure that any kind of paraffin, asphaltine, any kind of um, solids that you see, if there's a tendency for solids, um, go ahead and, and, you know, just do a water pump through um, and just get it, get it clean, as clean as you can, cheap, couple, couple hundred dollars, maybe thousand dollars to do it. Um, and, and blow it down to the facility and call it a day at the very least um, would be my hope. Well, good. Well, I know in, uh, on your next step is kind of from the maintenance side, it's going more into the uh, electrical and automation. So what, what do you mean? Uh, let's focus, I guess, on the electrical side first. What are you talking about on that? So on the electrical side, it, it's going to be like your tank grounding and things of that sort. You're, if you have lightning protection, having the lightning protection, um, review it and make sure it's still properly installed and is going to operate the way you purchased it to operate. Um, but the biggest and most important thing that I think a lot of operators miss is um, doing like valve function tests. So specifically on ESDs and emergency shutdown valves and things of that sort, this is a great time to be working those valves, testing those valves, ensuring that um, everything's calibrated properly, yeah. especially on your safety systems. Um, and if your facility is shut down, then working the shutdown valve or checking the shutdown valve function is not going to be an issue. You're not going to have to take a shutdown for it. So this is a great time to do that. If you have INE staff um, or automation staff, it can be done in-house potentially and um, free and just be utilizing those guys, um, which I think is I think is huge and it's gonna help you in the long term. It's something that a lot of operators miss on their maintenance plans um, and this is a great time to do it. Well, when you're I an mean, emergency shutdown valve, that, that's a huge priority. I mean, I had, um, I didn't have one that big, but I had a piece of equipment um, that we were renting out for three years. Uh, they were doing some work on their facility. They wanted us to do some integrity checks, so they made us bypass our equipment. And that was the first time that uh, our bypass valve was utilized in the three years. And uh, come to find out, it didn't work. It was uh, it was locked, uh, ready to go. So you know, an eighteen hundred dollar valve after three days worth of work, two guys replacing it out, buying a new valve, cost us around nine thousand dollars of, but and it uh, put a three day delay on their integrity tests. Um, so what we learned from that is on our back end stuff is when our technicians are going out now, we do a quick uh, check on everything, all valves uh, on a once a month basis, especially if it's in use. And uh, that's a cheap one. I can only imagine a emergency shutdown valve. Yeah. I mean, it could lead to a catastrophic failure, right? So a lot that's of right. emergency shutdown valves are on our wellhead in case the choke blows by um, to protect the flow line and to protect the facility down, li down line. Um, so those, those are the big guys. Um, so I would definitely prioritize it by any um, prevention of catastrophic failure and then move to the, the bypasses and things of that sort. And it is important to know that you can overwork ESDs. They are not supposed to be worked at a constant level. Um, so there's some API recommendations and, and you know my team can make recommendations as well um, as to how often to work those and, and uh, what frequency. Well, and uh, actually I, I do have a question for you. The, um, the does, when you're talking about the um, like ground rods, those type of things. Um, I guess for lightning, uh, that's happening. What we've seen every client do something different. Uh, they come down with different specs that we have to do. We get everything for our equipment ready to go out to their location. Then we go to location. Then they're wanting to make some modifications on location. Is there a, a master way of looking at it or who, who dictates that this is probably the safest way to do it? Or lightning protection or grounding? Grounding, yeah. Uh, there are some uh, regulations and codes. Um, I, I work with a lot of um, electrical consultants um, that can provide those recommendations. Um, that, that's who I'd go to. Um, I'd go to the regs and I'd go to your electrical consultants or your automation specialists um, who do the install installations every day. Everyone has their own theories on it and their own yeah. take just like everything else in this industry. Um, I think there's a couple principles that are pretty important. Um, and again, I, I, will go, I will say go back to the regs. Um, there's an API recommendation and guideline for that. Okay, awesome. 
Well, and that, um, so when you're talking about uh, automation style, I mean, on the automation, what do you, like, um, are you talking about call outs or SCADA systems or? Yeah, level transmitters, just to make sure they're functioning correctly and they're reading the level correctly. Pressure transmitters, anything like that, that that's operating something downstream, especially a lot, oftentimes your level transmitters are operating your transfer pumps or your pressure, there's a pressure transmitter that's, you know, supplying information to a shutdown valve. Um, all of those systems need to be tested. I always suggest once a year. Um, I have clients that do varying, you know, frequencies on, on those tests. Um, and I, you know, we, we know plenty of, of consultants that can go out and do that work, um, contractors. And so, you know, if anybody needs help on that, let us know. Cause it, to me, it's one of the, my passions when I build a facility, um, I do a risk analysis based off what kind of safety systems are out there. And if the safety systems aren't tested, that risk analysis is no good. Yeah. Um, and, and the risk could be very high. Um, it's a it's a small system that you don't really see and it's not it's not in your face so it's not reminding you um, some of the failures aren't going to be alarms um, so it, it's it just get kind of put in the background but it's a really really important system it's your last line of defense in a lot of cases mm -hmm. um, you know other than PSVs but oftentimes it's your last line of defense and you want to make sure that it's you know doing what it needs to be doing and it's it's operating well all right well good well, i know um on that you then you were pretty well going in i know you like talking about this you have a whole slide dedicated to swd so i uh, would expand on that why why focus so hard on this so swds i know is a very important um piece of the pro a lot of projects, um, especially Permian, where they're just water hogs. Um, so the, the real focus here is to do kind of think ahead. If there's you know, future development plans, this is kind of starting to transfer into some of the office workers and the engineers. These are ideas to, to look ahead. Um, if there's SVDs that um, are going to need to take additional water in the future, this is a great time to do the step rate test to understand how much water you can take um, what it will take to upsize the pumps um, and if additional perfs could work or doing an acid job to clean it out. Um, so this is just a great time to start development planning and understanding how your water systems are going to be um, able to handle the water that you're going to bring on in the future because we're going to drill baby drill very soon. Um, and then to, to understand, you know, the additional uh, electricity usage, with additional pumps and, and everything that goes with it. Um, oftentimes, SCBDs are the last part of the project, um, but oftentimes if a new SCBD needs to be drilled, it's a six to um, 12 month lead time on the permit. So just getting out and, and planning, um, it's something, it can make or break a project, whether or not you have an SCBD, um, you know, $1.70 for, for trucking the water versus you know, a dollar or 10 cents for disposing of it yourself. Um, it, it's a huge economic maker or breaker. So just to remind everyone to think through your SCVD systems um, or your disposal options for your development plan. And now is a good time to kind of test it, build on to it. If you need to do some additions or you, you need to take a shutdown to do, you know, put a T in so you can put additional tanks in in the future. This is a good time to do it if you're shut down. Well, and uh, so on the top things, if you have a, an existing location ready to go, I mean, what would be the top things that you would like to go out there and on your checklist to just double check how the integrity of the system is going on? So looking back at the injection profile, the pressure profiles, the rates, um, seeing if it's a loss or if, if the pump is having to push harder and pressure up harder, um, if we're getting less water out in the way, those are things that would tell me that to start looking at maybe an acid job, a clean out. Um, you know, this is a good time to call up the pump company and have them do complete pump maintenance mm -hmm. um, and, and just make sure everything's functioning correctly. Again, when an SVD goes down, everyone is scrambling. Um, so this is this is a great time to just kind of go through and, and review everything. Um, you know, making sure that that there's no lines plugged off internally. This is another good place to possibly do tank cleanouts because you don't want your pump pulling on tanks full of gunk or full of sand. 
Um, so these, you know, and oftentimes you have so much water moving through that you will, there will be particulates that carry over. Obviously filter maintenance, but everyone I'm sure is doing that on at least a monthly basis <laughs> um, and checking the pressure differentials on either side of your, your filters to make sure that you're not plugging off and causing artificial back pressure that you don't need. What, uh, what filters do you recommend? I mean, it's just a coalescing filter. Or, I mean, you've probably yeah. seen a number of work, different ways. Yeah, oftentimes, most of the time, we just do these filter pots um, okay. that are very simple. Um, you know, there's varying sizes um, depending on, on what you're expecting. Um, but yeah, just a real simple filter pot is often what we use for SCPDs. Okay. Well, awesome. And I know um, your next topic that I know you're focusing on right now is the uh, containment. So that, yeah, that's... Um, that's pretty big. Uh, I've been to a number of locations where you got it, it's perfect, everything's pristine, and you got other ones where it just it just looks like someone just bulldozed everything down. So, yeah, tell us about that. So, um, for those who don't know, I do SPCC plans as well, and so I'm very passionate about um, containment and upkeep because I, I stamp those plans and 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 you know certify that those containments are good and they will remain good. Um, so just just to show you the like the, the strength of it or the like the validity of, of a SPCC plans and secondary containments, um, oftentimes at secondary containments, the only thing stopping you between an oil leak during a rainfall going into a navigable body of water and a very major oil spill response occurring. Um, so having those sized correctly at, at least 110%. Um, of your largest vessel within that containment is huge. And then making sure that you don't have erosion if it's an earthen berm, or you don't have holes through it if it's um, a polylined or steel, steel corrugated wall uh, berm. So it's just, it's something that's really easy to miss because as pumpers go every day, um, you know, there might be a little slope that just slowly gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So this is where we really suggest, you know, engineers go down and do a full review of the field and just walk each site and look, look at just containment. Um, and I know in some cases it's a lot of sites and it's a really long day, yeah. but it can save you from a catastrophic failure and an oil spill response that goes into navigable bodies of water is not anything I would wish on anyone. Um, my dad was an oil spill response consultant and um, spent many of nights, um, you know, helping people respond to these things, going through lawsuits after lawsuits because someone's water was contaminated downstream or animals died. Uh, and and those, those are just situations that are not necessary. Um, and these containments can save you from that. Well, and that, um, I'm actually kind of curious about that. You go to some of these locations, it's kind of like a, they, they kick it, like they're kicking a tire to a, a car and they're like, yeah, it's a, it look, it's a good car. I, but they go up to these earthen berms and they kick it a couple of times. And I mean, how do you do a, what do you, when you go out there, what do you look for? I mean, what are some signs of like weeds growing up or? Yeah, you wanna make sure weeds and any kind of roots. Um, piping within the berm oftentimes um, if it's not taped up properly, because that is an air um, soil interface for piping, um, that can be an issue. It actually can cause the piping to rupture. Uh, oh. And any kind of holes through it, um, a lot of times, like on, you know, these, these newer, we want to cut, a, you know, a pipe through it, through the containment so that we don't have to go up over it and cause back pressure. Um, and so if it's not done correctly, it's not polylined off, and um, those holes will just be leak points. Um, you know, I've seen, I've seen so much, I've seen, you know, virtually like, it looks like a tiny garden growing in there. Um, it almost looks like they purposely like grassed it out. And, and when you, when you start having vegetation in there, you start losing some of your um, containment capacity. So you no longer have 110%. Um, so things like that. And then on earthen berms, you slowly will lose the hype of the berm um, as erosion happens, wind, water, whatever it might be. Um, and at that point, you need to be measuring that hype 
And if it gets below the height of what's in your SBCC plans, you need to rerun it and make sure that there's still enough capacity. So if you do have a failure of one of your largest vessel, you'll have enough room for the vessel's full fluid or, or tank's full fluid plus some storm water. Um, mm. So earthen berms, are, they, they take some upkeep. And oftentimes, earthen berms are older sites that produce less. Um, so the upkeep's harder. To, to you know to do um, clients are less likely to want to spend money on sites that make less um, but those those tanks often sit there four or five days full of fluid before they call in a truck to come load out and so those are oftentimes the largest risk and a lot of times they don't have level control um, automation and things of that sort so we don't even know when it's getting to a high level um, so those are oftentimes your highest risk sites. Uh, so those are the ones that need to be upkept. So if, uh, if a client, I guess, um, or someone has a question on this is if they came in and say, Hey, I need some SBCC, um, plans done, uh, by your, by your firm. Uh, do y'all do that? Does your firm yeah. do that? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll go out, we'll do all the measurements, all the photos and everything associated. We even put together plot plans and things of that sort that are required, um, all the maps. And we've even, um, uh, for a site in very far out in New Mexico, we've even proven there were 17 locations. We were able to prove that there was no navigable bodies of water that, they, that these sites were threatening. So we're able to prove that an SPCC site wasn't required. And we then stamped that documentation uh, in case you you know in case there is an EPA right. well, I would see that I would see that to be a PR nightmare if you have um, if you have leaks going on and then proving that it's going into a nearby creek or um, you know even in, into the fields I think that would be just terrible right now you know with all well, the stuff that's going on and then you have to deal with that yeah. In, in South Texas and then things of that sort, um, I do a lot of work in South Texas and Permian. Oftentimes, you don't know there's a creek until there's a hundred year flood. Um, uh -oh. and that is, that's the issue, right? Um, yeah. so, so we take topographic maps and we go back and look at historical data to see where the navigable bodies of water are, which the definition of a U.S. navigable body of water is five pages long. So there's a lot of caveats to it. Um, but we, we go in there and, and try to determine where your closest and, and highest risk point is so that if there is a spill, you know where to stick those bulldozers and sandbags and whatever else you got up your sleeve um, to prevent that from getting to the outer body of water, which then becomes um, a national spill and, and then the publicity is inevitable. Yeah. I didn't know your dad did that. That's a, is that what made you want to get into that? That's what gave me the breadth of, of the SPCC. So I do have an expert. He wrote the API bulletin on writing SPCC plans. So I do have a good amount of experience behind me on that. I live five minutes from him, so I utilize him a lot. Um, so that combined with my facility engineering gives me the ability to look at these sites and, and get a little creative on um, some of the, the safety measures. Mm -hmm. um, and so I try to use that to help uh, help my clients as much as I can. Does that ever go to your head? It would just seem like if someone's ar like railroad commission arguing with you, you would just say, "My dad literally wrote the book." Can you just like drop it? You don't do anything that glamorous and dramatic. <laughs> you know, I, I probably need to print it out so I can just drop it on someone. Yeah, <laughs> that would be helpful. But yes, I have had fights with people. Um, the hundred ten percent seems to be a varying number, but we've been able to cite it in inspector gu inspector guidelines and things of that sort. But yes, I have had fights with people where I'm quoting things but I don't ever pull my dad in because I, I want to make sure yeah. you know, I, yeah. I, it's uh, nice to have an expert in the background to, to debate with absolutely absolutely well let's um let's go on to uh you so see your next one was uh trainings and I know you focus heavily on trainings so and that's why you're even on here today I know you have a passion for educating and uh, trying to get the best success out there so in your mind trainings I mean what what do you recommend to your clients so I, I do have a passion for trainings, uh, especially I've been around a lot of really green um, lease operators. And so this is the perfect time, the perfect time to teach them anything that you haven't had time to teach them before. Um, we've, you know, we've seen lease operators make really bad decisions 
Um, I've been a part of a couple um, investigations into very serious or um, deadly injuries that, that were caused because people didn't understand the systems. They don't understand, they didn't understand the purposes of lockout tagout. Um, and so this is the time to really explain why these processes are so important um, and where the dangers are. So um, that, that, I mean, th this is the perfect time, right? And you can do virtual trainings, you can do Zoom calls and, and just have just different subject matter experts discuss, you know, how, how a heater treater works and the internals of it. Just very simple things that, that some, some lease operators just haven't had the joy of learning. Um, so it's a great time for that. But even more than that, it's a great time to get your yearly SBCC training checked out. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, my group can, can do that training via Zoom if we need to. Okay. Uh, or you can do it internally if, if, you, if you feel comfortable enough with knowing your plan. It's a really simple checkoff. But this is a good time that you can spend the time to really explain the importance of the SBCC plans. It's not just a check mark. It's really to prevent some major failures or catastrophes um, down the road. So this is this is a good time. H2S trainings. Uh, I work in fields 4,000, 15,000 parts per million. I've worked in a you know 33% parts per or 33% H2S field. Um, it's highly important. Most companies require at least yearly H2S trainings. This is a good time to go ahead and, and push that out while we have time. Um, because once, once oil prices kick back up, we're all going to be chasing them. Um, that's right. We're going to be drilling and we're going to be completing anything that's been ducked. Um, and we're going to be in a huge rush to get things back online and get, get capital flowing again. So taking this time to get all that stuff out of the way, all the housekeeping pieces, um, but for both fields and office, it's great. Flipboard pathogens and pandemic right. trainings that are now required. This is a great yeah. time. It goes out of the way, although I'm sure everyone knows to wash your hands and wear a mask. But any OSHA trainings, um, HSE trainings, whether it's you know um, behavior-based safety programs or safe work, um, this is this is the time to improve everyone. This is the time to um, teach them large volumes of, of information that they'll be able to go and take and apply. And if you're if you do feel comfortable having your teams out on site, you can do on site trainings um, and making sure they understand the valving and things like that on some of the facilities. So just a, it's just a great time to educate. Um, but I, I think so right now also is. Um... You know, at all the budgets that are getting cut right now, I don't think training is one of them. Uh, it just leads to too many mistakes. Um, because I'm a Black Belt and Six Sigma, we register all non-conformances. And uh, over the last five years, 82% of our non-conformances in our organization, it could be just, oh, I forgot, I told that guy, but I forgot to follow up on him. We do an NCR on it because it's a, it's a process failure. What we find out, it's really not on the employees that is the failure. It's, it's a... Um, communication based. So over 80% of our NCRs is really just communication, not understanding, assuming. So if you have some basic trainings and they have a, at least a foundational guideline to follow back on, they can, let's just say that SPC, like you were saying, is if they had a basic understanding of why they're doing that, the 110%, and they're seeing weeds grow everywhere, they're seeing these things, that lease pump or gauger, I mean, he could call the office and say, hey, I, you know, I'm catching some things out here. We probably need to kick that back so we can um, get this thing fixed. Give, give them purpose to what they're doing, right? Right. Um, so it's not just a check mark. It's not just, oh, I have to do this. Let's just get this done on our monthly, you know, inspections or in your annual inspections. It, it's to give them, like, I'm doing this so that I don't have to be up in the middle of the night with a shovel attempting to prevent oil from getting into a navigable body of water, which can cause a lot of issues for the company. It's just putting some of that weight and gravity to the trainings uh, that, again, we don't normally have time for. So, um, Well, on the, the trainings, you also talk about your key compliance items, and I know you really like compliance, so. Um, I, don't, I don't like compliance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no one likes compliance, but um, I really don't like when we're non-compliant and we get right. caught. 
Um, that is definitely the worst, worst case. Um, and, and, you know, if you know that you're not compliant on some, some pieces right now, this is a great time to become compliant, especially things are shut down. Um, a lot of times to get compliance, the Revenue Commissioner, whoever, whatever agency you're in compliant with, is going to require a shutdown. So if you're already shut down, go ahead, take care of it. Um, again, SBCC plans, get compliance, uh, it, which need to be created within six months of startup. Um, and then, you know, let me know if you have any questions on that, because I know it. Um, H trust contingency plans is another piece. H nines, um, anything greater than hundred PPM in Texas is, is required, um, by the statewide rule 36. Um, I have people that can help you with that. Not me. Yeah. Uh, people that can help with that though um and then your ats manual um, a lot of small guys obviously the big guys you guys got that stuff covered but a lot of small guys have just been sprinting so hard and so fast they use an hes manual from a previous company that's not all applicable it's a good time to go through it um and and really fine-tune it get your programs correct um emergency response plans air permitting, which a lot of times is painful, but um, making sure your air permitting is correct is huge. We see the Railroad Commission doing flyovers, and uh, yeah. I think I saw an article that uh, the Railroad Commission said in the Permian, 50% of flares are used incorrectly right. and um, are not effectively burning. And so just, just those pieces are huge. It's going to become a more important um, piece of business here shortly. Um, if we're gonna follow Colorado at all, which has really gotten strict on the air regs. Um, so to get up to our current spec is really important. Um, depending on what happens this election year, we might be adding additional specs to it. So you wanna make sure you're at the baseline at the very least. Um, and then remediation, um, compliance on, on spills and everything of that sort. In DOT compliance, being ready for your internal audits, making sure that your operators are qualified and, and things of that sort. That's a whole nother presentation worth of data, but um, your DOT compliance is also huge um, if you have DOT pipelines. Well, that's what, um, so the Railroad Commission, they asked, I saw that article, um, they said one out of five is just not functioning at all, but they said 50% is um, not up to spec or not functioning properly. So one out of five is just not usable. So if the Railroad Commission, it, it's almost like they're trying to give a warning out to everybody of like, look, we know what the stats are and we're, we are coming. It might be next year, it might be the year after, but we will be we will have to do and push our through, uh, do our job and be regulators, enforcers of the code. So yeah. it's a good warning shot, right? You know, it's yeah. time, to, time to step it up. Uh, you did mention uh, a couple months ago, you're telling me that um, you could almost tattletale on yourself to the Railroad Commission. You can say, look, we're, we know we're not in compliance, but we got a mitigation strategy to get in compliance. And walk us through that. How, how is that even possible? What do you do there? Um, you, you email them and tell, tell yourself, <laughs> but I would say the most important thing is have all your documents um, put together prior to that um, and be, be okay with some sort of punishment. Um, you know, it, it might happen. And if it's a list of compliance items, um, oftentimes we suggest that you have a consultant email them and kind of lay out what's going on and try to understand what they would suggest or or what they feel like the ramifications would be. Um, it, just, just to kind of understand how deep you're going to be in. Yeah. Um, and, and certain compliance items have varying, you know, consequences. Mm -hmm. uh, if it has to do with H2S, public safety, and things of that sort, it's going to be, it definitely is going to be a higher, higher threshold of consequences. Um, if it's, it's something smaller and it can be fixed easily, potentially less consequences. I make no promises when it comes to railroad commissioner or regulatory right. agencies. It depends on um, if they ate their Wheaties that day or something and they're mad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it's definitely varying amounts of responses that you can get, but they're usually really excited for people who are wanting to become compliant. Um, they want to encourage that. And, okay. it, you know, 
they, they know that once you've turned yourself in, then going forwards, you've learned your lesson, right? You're going to do the right thing. So they want to encourage that. Um, and yeah, there's plenty of consulting firms. We have, we have a couple of people who work for ATEX that can help with that. Um, but you know, there's plenty of subject matter experts on, on compliance items. So just getting a quick consultation from one of them um, can significantly help and, and put you, help put you together a timeline and what documents are necessary for the different compliance items. Um, well, what I think about is all these companies buying new locations out, doing these different things. There's a lot of, with oil and gas prices, a lot of trading, mergers, acquisitions going on. So if you buy out, it's almost impossible to visit every field that you're buying. You're looking at production logs, what you're doing. But when you finally go out there, I think that would be, I think Railroad Commission would kind of look at that as, look, I just bought yeah. this. I found <laughs> this. We're trying to get it back into your compliance now. Yeah, usually acquisitions, there's some exceptions and kind of an overall umbrella. They give you a little bit of leeway there. Um, but I would say if you were buying an asset, please do a phase one in or phase two um, review. Have someone do a desktop review to understand what kind of compliance issues are currently standing, what kind of, um, you know, fines or, or um, negative feedback there is available for these, for these sites. Mm -hmm. And if there seems to be a large amount, then go forward with the phase two, because remediation projects can cost millions depending on where you are, depending on how deep the spill is and how it's affecting the ground. Um, so those types of items can give you um, some, some good leeway whenever you're acquiring to get the prices reduced because you will have to pay those in order to become within compliance. So compliance is one of those pieces um, that I would look at for sure before you close on a deal. Um, there are plenty of teams, including my own, and I can get you in touch with hundreds of others that can help you with doing a phase one. Um, it, it's, I think it's really important. A lot of times we don't look at surface when we're acquiring stuff and it comes to bite us in the butt. Yeah. Well, on that uh, compliance items, you have a company, company initiatives. So I know you, you're focusing on that, you know, you've been talking about that throughout uh, kind of common denominator throughout this presentation, but like what company initiatives, um, what, what do you mean by that? This goes all the way from the field, all the way to Houston, San Antonio, Austin, who, wherever your corporate office can be. So field to office initiatives. Um, look at inventory that, you know, and equipment try to really understand what out of service equipment that you have that you can get refurbished. This is a good time to create that list so that whenever you do start developing or you have, you know, replacement projects you need to do down the line, you know what's in house and you can keep your spend low. Cause I think 2020s will continue to be the year of keeping spend low. Um, you want to focus on creating an, an opportunity bank. Um, this is something that I did when I worked at another company and it was huge. And make sure that you are comparing all the economics of these projects on apples to apples basis to the same, um, the same oil and gas prices, the same price stack over time. Um, and look at SWD projects and you know, gas um, optimization projects with compression, um, along with your workovers and your recompletes and, and your drilling projects, um, just to, to see where you can really save money or you know, spend money appropriately to make money. Um, SCD reviews, like we discussed, renegotiate contracts right now, as I'm sure everyone knows, water hauling has gotten way down from in the areas I've been working, $1.70 to $1.30. Um, so, you know, focus on renegotiating contracts or compressor co rental contracts and things of that sort. Create standards to streamline processes in the future. It's easier to do bid work if you have standards in place. Um, and then work on creating just more organized filing system. I've done this with my team <laughs> on our drive is, is really focused on filing and documentation and things of that sort. Um, while we're a little bit slower, it, it, that helps for sure. Absolutely. I know the, um, I like what you said earlier about the opportunity bank. So how, how, how did that work? It just, every time there was something like, we don't have time right now, but in the future we can handle that. And then well, it just yeah. kind of or we don't have money, right? Yeah. That's the real big, is we don't have money right now, but here's a really great project. Um, and make sure you're cataloging it all in one central database. Um, and the big thing, often, like, 
oftentimes management wants to see this once a month. That would be a good initiative. Um, just to, to see that it's growing, to make sure everything's, you know, there's whether there's an NPV or a rate of return or what, whatever economic um, piece you want to tie this to, make sure that it's all apples to apples so you can really prioritize your projects. And maybe there's an SWD project that's going to reduce your, your OPEX um, that might be smarter to spend money on than a recomplete. Um, so just so that you can compare these projects appropriately. So when there is capital available, you know where to spend it. You can already start doing some of the, the design work and the project background. Um, so that as soon as there is capital, you can get going. Or you can help build next year's budget with these things too, whether it's maintenance work or things of that sort. Um, you know, we're, we're almost halfway through the year. We're going to be creating budgets again soon. Yeah. Um, and hopefully for a much better year. So... Um, all of those pieces is great to do right now. Absolutely. Well, I know um, we got a and a section at the end, uh, but I did want to go over, uh, we got Chad Dorsett joining us in two weeks. He's a former production foreman and uh, he's going to be looking at plunger lifts and uh, LOE savings that from his past experience over the last 20 years. And then on July 21st, we have Terry Nelson with WPI specifically talking about glycol dehydration. Um, now, if you're interested in being a webinar speaker or know of someone that would be a good fit, please reach out to us. Uh, reach out uh, specifically to tori.valagura at croftsystems.net or you can go to our website. Uh, there's various ways of saying, I know of someone that would like to do this or I, I want something to share it out to the industry. Now, at the end of this presentation, uh, you're going to be getting a pop-up for our uh, survey. It's a quick survey. Now, again, I'm Six Sigma, so all of this is perfect feedback into us of what are you looking for, more visuals, you want faster timing, if you don't like the 11 a.m., just give us that feedback, and then uh, we'll be shipping out a free hat or shirt to you. Um, so uh, ending that, uh, I'd like to go to the Q&A section, but our information for my information and Alyssa's information is on this. So reach out to us. Um, if you have specific questions on LinkedIn, you want to go out or you want to get a text onto some projects that you have going on. This is a, this is a good time to uh, reach out to us. If you have any specific questions, uh, now is the time again, go to zoom, uh, put in your questions, but there is two questions that did pop up uh, before this meeting that was entered. Uh, it says, can ATEX conduct evaluations on um, acquisition? So earlier you were saying, I guess, phase one, phase two. Is that something that if they're looking at buying a facility or several fields, you could go out? Yeah, absolutely. We have, um, we have a woman who does our regulatory who has extreme experience in phase one and phase twos. Um, she actually used to work for the TCQ, so uh, she knows she knows it. She knows the system pretty well. So yeah, we can do phase one, phase two. So please let us know, and, and we'd love to provide a proposal for that. All right, perfect. And then the second question I got is, uh, where do you go to tell the railroad commission about issues? Um, so you can look and find email addresses for particular people, whether it's pipeline safety um, or oil and gas. Um, also, we can help you help you find those people, and we can kind of be your mouthpiece until you're ready to say who you are and what your issue is, um, which is the joy of being a consultant is we're not tied to any particular company. So this is it's a good opportunity to bring us in and, and ask us those questions. Or, like I said, you can, oftentimes on the Railroad Commission, you can find specific emails, and right now emails is the best way to contact them since a lot of times they're not in office. I think they're working some really weird, like they go to the office on Monday, they can't go Tuesday, and then they go Wednesday. Um, so email is really the best way to communicate with them, and then they can provide you their cell phone um, number if, if they feel like they, they want to have a discussion. Right. Well, we have no more questions right now. We've got five minutes left, so we're going to end this webinar. But Alyssa, thank you for coming on, talking with us, sharing that information. Uh, based on the feedback, I'll be shipping that out to you. And again, everybody, if y'all need to get a hold of Alyssa or me, uh, our information's below. This will be going up on our blog and our YouTube channel. So thank y'all, everyone, for attending. Thank you, everybody.